welcome to Scotland and to South Lanarkshire, North East Lanarkshire, is it? North West Lanarkshire, let me get it right. We're in the town of Blantyre, eight miles to the southeast of Glasgow, and the town Blantyre is famous as the birthplace, amongst other things, of David Livingstone. We're the guest chair of the old parish church, which is celebrating 450 years of Christian worship on this site. On our panel here, Jean Freeman was once a member of the Communist Party. She was the first woman to chair the National, Scottish National Union of Students. Elected to the Scottish Parliament almost a year ago, she's now the Minister for Social Security. In those elections, the Conservatives beat Labour to take second place, winning 31 seats in the 129-seat Parliament. A beneficiary of this surge is Adam Tompkins, now Shadow Secretary for Communities, Social Security, the Constitution and Equalities. In his spare time, he's also Professor of Public Law at Glasgow University. Up from England for this programme, two panellists, a Scott, who is a Labour peer in the UK Parliament and who served as Lord Chancellor and the very first Justice Secretary, Charlie Faulkner, and joining them, Mark Littlewood, who used to be campaigns director for the human rights group Liberty. For some years now, though, he's been director general of the Institute of Economic Affairs, which was founded in 1955 and therefore lays claim to being the first free market think tank. Our panel. <laughs> and could we please have our first question? Jack Donaghy. Is a vote for the SNP a vote for a second independence referendum? Lord Faulkner. No, I don't think it is. I think what we're going to have now is a general election, and I think that it's a general election for the UK Parliament. It's deciding who our national government should be, not whether there should be a second referendum. And I think the big choice in this election is whether or not uh, the country, that means the whole of the United Kingdom, should be swinging to the right and voting Conservative, or whether we want to stay in the centre and the centre-left. And I think the only way that that could be achieved to avoid this great lurch to the right, which is taking place because Mrs May is taking advantage of what she perceives to be favourable opinion polls, is if people vote in huge numbers for Labour right across the country, because they are the only party that is questing for power nationally, and they are the only party that can stop both a lurch to the right in domestic policy, but also a very, very hard Brexit. So in no, it's not about Indie Ref 2, it's about what happens to this country in the next five years and maybe beyond. Charlie Faulkner, in Scotland, the uh, Labour Party has virtually wiped out the last election, one seat. The polls yeah. suggest it's going to be a, another wipeout. So you're rather whistling in the dark by saying everyone in Scotland should vote Labour if they want to uh, keep a centre ground in British politics. Uh, you're right, you're right. We were pretty well wiped out in the last general election in Scotland. But as I said in answer to the question, this is a debate about who runs the national government. So what does the, the, the general so election what, is what not is just happening in Scotland, it's happening right across so the country. What, what does a vote for the SNP, then, mean in Scotland? Well, I, I don't think people in Scotland believe that they are voting to whether there should be a second independence referendum. I think what they think so, they are voting for is who should be in Parliament, in the national uh, Parliament. And that's what the election's about. Adam Tonkin. I think Charlie Faulkner has just demonstrated how little the Labour Party understands Scotland. I mean, any vote for the SNP is always, in any election or in any, refer in any, in any referendum, a vote for independence. It's what the SNP believe in above all else. If you don't believe me, look at the SNP party membership card, which says it on the back of the, of the, of the very card. You know, the, 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 the election in Scotland is going to be principally about who can stand up to the SNP, who can stand up to the SNP's constant agitation for a second independence referendum. They will use uh, any pretext uh, for a second independence referendum. They are all about independence. If you uh, want uh, to stop a second independence referendum, uh, then you should vote for the only party that is prepared to stand up to the SNP in Scotland and prepared to stand up to the SNP uh, anywhere, and that is, of course, Ruth Davidson's uh, Scottish uh, Conservative Party. Uh, we said very clearly that now is not the time for a second independence uh, referendum. Nicola Sturgeon would very much like this, refer this election not to be about a second independence referendum because she knows that support for independence is declining and support for a second referendum is declining, but she was overall, just as she was on her feet saying that, saying that uh, in the Scottish Parliament only yesterday, uh, she was... Uh, 
uh, undermined and overruled by her predecessor, Alex Hammond, who was live on uh, network TV, saying precisely the opposite. A vote for the SNP is always a vote for independence. They will always use votes for their party as a mandate for independence. If you don't believe in independence, vote for the Conservatives, because we're the only party that will stand up to the SNP and stop an unwanted, divisive and unnecessary second independence referendum. Jane Freeman, as a matter of fact, if the better SNP does, presumably strengthens the case for a second referendum, the worse the SNP does, that case is thereby so much weakened? Well, we already have a mandate for a second referendum. It was in the manifesto that we were elected on it almost a year ago in the Holyrood elections. And it is a mandate that's been endorsed by the Scottish Parliament. So the key question around whether or not there is another independence referendum is whether or not the Westminster government will block the will of the Scottish Parliament. That's the key question. Now, it's, it, is no, it is no great surprise to have Adam bang on as he has just done. Because what the Tories in Scotland desperately want people in Scotland to think is that somehow the Tories in Scotland are the nice, smiley, shiny people, not at all hardline, not at all now thorough to Brexit, which will cost us in Scotland at least 80,000 jobs, not at all part of the Tory government at UK that is cutting welfare and social security spending for those in work, for people who are disabled, for uh, children, that the Tories in Scotland are somehow different. Well, they are most definitely not. And what Adam would much rather do is deflect away from their support for the Tories at UK rather than face up to what they are doing to people in Scotland. And in one sense, I agree with Charlie. Because this general election is about what kind of country do we want to live in. Now, Theresa May, with a very small majority, has managed to go for a hardline Brexit with delusions of trade deals with other parts of the world, which frankly are not queuing up to have those trade deals, with cuts in welfare spend, as I've already said, a continued economic driver, which is about austerity, but still protecting tax cuts for the rich. So it is about who do we want from Scotland to be the strong opposition? And with the greatest of respect, strong opposition. Where do you the get strong that line from? opposition to the Tories at Westminster. So let me ask you and, this. So let me ask you this. By the way, Adam, no, no, hold, I got hold, hold it second. Let me from ask you our Jean, argument Jean, in 2015. OK, let, let me ask you this. If you are in favour of the union, but you do not like the Conservatives, you should vote Labour, presumably. No, no, you shouldn't. You, you should vote for the SNP, and I'll tell you why you should vote for the SNP. <laughs> because, because if you look at what the SNP in Westminster has done, it has been an opposition. I'm afraid the Labour Party in Westminster has most definitely not been an opposition. It has been a colluder with what the Tories are doing. Okay. So if you want strong voices from Scotland that argue that Westminster should not block the will of the Scottish Parliament, argue against Tory policies, then that vote has to be an SNP vote. Mark, Mark Littlewood. Well, look, uh, look, of course a vote for the SNP is a vote not just for a second referendum, it is a vote for a party that <coughs> favours Scottish independence outright. I mean, this is no great secret, yeah. right? The clue's in the name of the party, the yeah. Scottish National Party. It's hardly a plot. And although it is true that uh, Westminster will ultimately decide this, I think whether or not there is a second independence referendum in Scotland in the coming years will depend quite heavily on the outcome, particularly in Scotland here, which is not likely to affect, I think, the overall uh, majority in Westminster. What will be looked at about whether you guys want a second referendum and whether you want to revisit that issue. And the Scottish National Party stand for the position that you should and that you could go independent. And the more seats and the more votes the Scottish National Party get, the more likely it is that you will have a second referendum. Charlie Faulkner mentions that this election is about the next five years and maybe beyond. 
I can't think of a bigger question in the next five years or beyond for Scotland, given that the UK is leaving the European Union, about whether you wish to consider again whether you want to become an independent nation. And you should consider that long and hard before you decide how to cast your vote one way or another okay. on June the 8th. Thank you. I should say that our panel n never knows what the precise question is that's coming up, or they might guess that these issues are coming up. Um, and it happens that our next question is quite pertinent in relation to the first question. Can we have it, please? John Collard. Does nationalism contribute to unity or division in a society? Uh, you were saying about casting your vote just now, Mark Littlewood, and having to think carefully. What's your view about that? It depends. I don't think there is a straight answer to that question. I want to live in a, a continent, a country, and a world, not in which nationalism doesn't exist, but in which nationalism is safe. I think the dangers you, you get um, in all sorts of parts of the world is when nationalism isn't expressed as civic nationalism, but is, is expressed in some sort of racist or superior fashion. Nationalism, per se, is not a problem. I think it is quite linked to self-determination, a desire for people to control their own affairs, and I think that can be an enormously positive force. The job of politicians, and crucially, our institutional and constitutional structure, is to make sure that that nationalistic pride can be expressed in a positive, safe fashion rather than a destructive one. That's actually how you can measure the countries that succeed in the world and those that don't. Charlie Faulkner, does nationalism contribute to unity or division in a society? I think nationalism can be a very, very unifying force. How we feel about ourselves is very much bound up with how we feel about the country in which we live and the country to which we feel uh, a link with. So if you're Scottish, uh, you feel strongly that Scotland expresses your own values. You can be British as well and believe that that expresses your values as well. And it's a means of bringing people together a sense that we share values. It's absolutely obvious, though, that nationalism, not in the United Kingdom, but in other places, is intensely divisive and leads to things like ethnic cleansing and other sorts of utter horrors throughout the world. In the UK, I think nationalism is essentially a source of strength, not a source of weakness. But I think that because I'm really proud of being Scottish. I'm really proud of being somebody in the United Kingdom because I think our values are worthwhile and I think ultimately that's a unifying force rather than a divisive force. Charlie Faulkner, one of your... <laughs> one of the leaders of your party a long time ago, Michael Foote, yeah. made a distinction, which others have since been making and quite recently, uh, between, on the one hand, patriotism yeah. and, on the other hand, nationalism. The former, he was passionately in favour of. The latter, he was passionately against. You don't make that distinction. I don't make that distinction because I think a passionate feeling that one is Scottish and all the things that Scots value and regard as important is nationalism and it is not, ultimately, a force for disunity. Uh, Adam Tompkins, and maybe you should, in this context, deal with this country of Scotland. Um, I think that uh, nationalism uh, is and is capable of being a force both for unity and for division. But what clearly is a force for division um, is the um, uh, nationalist obsession with referendums. It's referendums that divide people. It's referendums that divide people, and we've had two referendums in, the, in, in this part of the United Kingdom in the last uh, couple of years. We had the independence referendum and we had the Brexit referendum, and both of them, in my judgment, were unpleasant affairs. I would be uh, quite happy, uh, Jonathan, to go to my grave uh, never having to fight another referendum campaign. I'm, I'm a parliament man. I think w w what we do is we elect parliaments uh, to represent the people, to make decisions on behalf of the people, uh, and I think that the, uh, what has been divisive in Scottish politics uh, in uh, recent years is not so much nationalism but, but 
having secession this, uh, referendums. That was a de that was a divisive is, and un an, un an unpleasant uh, affair. But look, there's nothing. There's, there's, you, you know, you don't, you don't have to be a believer in referendums uh, to be an, a nationalist. And what Charlie and Mark have said is absolutely right. That nationalism is capable of being a force for good in the world. Uh, is capable of bringing uh, people Mark together. Mark is shaking his head in disagreement. A, a sense I mean, of, of civic pride. Look, of course, referendums are divisive because people vote in different ways. Democracy is divisive because people vote in different ways. Uh, the only thing, you know, if you want a situation in which there's no division, don't allow a multi-party democracy. No. Uh, so of course there's going to be division. Most elections in the United divisive. Kingdom are nothing like as divisive as, as either of the referendum campaigns were in 2014 or 2016. And the ordinary life of a parliamentarian is not always to divide. There's much more that Jean and I and other uh, MSPs agree the on than we disagree are on. by their but nature divisive. Adam, that is just nonsense. Do you know, Gene. in the 2014, the 2014 referendum saw a higher proportion of people in Scotland registering to vote than ever. Why did that happen? Because politics around that referendum engaged people. It opened up to people. It involved them. It was not, absolutely not, the divisive horrible campaign that you and others would like to carry. So why do a clear as? majority of Scots no, not want on, to go through it again? On, why do a clear majority of Scots how, not want hold, to go through it again on, then, Jean? Adam, just hold on a wee minute and let me finish. <laughs> now, and I mean, Mark is right. Do you know, it was Donald Dewar who said that we Scots are a disputatious race. We a famous, love a good a famous Scottish Labour MP, for those Indeed, few who well, don't know. our first First Minister in Scotland. And he was absolutely right. There's nothing we like more than a good argument. But you know, there's, there is a difference between argument and disagreement and exchange of ideas robustly and division. There's a big difference. And we must not let democratic argument and debate and discussion passionately held be characterized as divisive. It is central. <laughs> Absolutely central. And let me, say, let me say this too. I agree with what has been said before. Nationalism can be both divisive, but it can also be a source of strength and unifying. And when it is passionate, outward looking, about civic progress and development, then it is a source of strength. And there are people okay. in Scotland who will be passionate about being Scottish and not support independence. That doesn't make them any less Scottish. It okay. makes them one of those who live and work in the same country as I do. Okay. And they have okay. every okay. right to have okay. that view. Charlie Faulkner. I don't think nationalism in the UK is essentially divisive. But there is always danger when a particular country seeks to break away from an institution it's been a member of for a long time. And you could see it in relation to the Brexit situation, where as a result of the United Kingdom breaking away from the European Union, that appears to involve hostility towards the 27 other nations, when in fact I don't think that's what's intended. Equally in relation to the Scotland versus the rest of the country situation, although I do not believe that the values of Scotland and the values of England are significantly different. Whenever there is discussions about separation, then nationalism increases tension. And that's got to be really, really watched, because whatever happens, I don't think the UK wants to be at odds with the 27 other nations of the European Union, nor do I think that England wants to be at odds with Scotland, or Scotland at odds with England. If, but my point is that sorry, it isn't inevitable to be like that. It's not inevitable. And language is important. Charlie is right about what people probably did not want to happen when they voted to leave the European Union. They probably did not want our Prime Minister to use words like battle, which she has been using. So it's about language and tone as well as what you are actually trying to achieve. It need not be divisive. And we have said consistently, we said it in 2014, you know, England is our good neighbours. Good heavens, my dad was English. My brother was born in England. England is not an enemy. Jean? Northern Ireland or what? Wales aren't enemies. But we have the Jean? right here in Scotland to choose our own path. Jean, what you say? 
what you say is, of course, extremely interesting, but we've got a lot to get through. Absolutely. So forgive me. We move on to our next question with a reminder of any answers. The number to ring Anita Anand is at any answers. 03 700 100 444. She'll be waiting <laughs> for your calls. You can email any.answers at bbc.co.uk. Tweet hashtag BBCAQ. You're already doing it. And follow us at BBC Any Questions. We please will go to our next. Carol Clark. Can we take it as a given that the Scottish Government will mitigate the rape clause as they did the bedroom tax? And can Adam Tompkins say yes or no? Is the rape clause wrong? It has been, in Scotland as elsewhere, a very big issue. Essentially, under the welfare changes which have come into force now, or have just come into force, um, there are limits on tax credits and to universal credit to the first two children's child benefit. Um, and that there are exclusions from that, one of which is this so-called rape clause, which means you can, but the terms under which you, uh, it is decided whether or not um, you can uh, qualify for that have caused the row. Um, I'm going to start with you, as you are the Minister. Jean Freeman, will you mitigate the rape clause? The, the two-child policy, which is actually what produces the rape clause, is fundamentally wrong, in my opinion. And the Prime Minister justified it this week on the basis that families, house, families out of work should have to make the same choices as families in work, except for the fact that two-thirds of households who receive child tax credit are in work. And it is an indication of the paucity of the wages that they're on in those households that they have to have that financial support. So this isn't about benefit scroungers on the one hand and hard-working people on the other. It's about a policy that will, by its impact, push more households, and in particular more children, into poverty. And the rate clause is a particularly distasteful and heinous part of that. Because not only, as a woman, do you have to say that your third child was born as a result of rape, you have to name that child in a public document, and you have to say that you are no longer living with the person who raped you, even if that is your husband, and you are. Now, how much further back, how many more decades do, we, do the Tories want to roll back our understanding of in-marital sexual abuse of women, of rape, of the consequences of that? How much further back? So on the question of mitigation, which the Tories have been quick in Scotland to say to us, well, if you're the Scottish Government and you don't like it, then you fix it. A bit ironic, I think, from a party that supports the union that it's going to be okay to fix it for women in Scotland and deal tack the hindmost for the women who live in England, Wales or Northern Ireland. And in Northern Ireland, by the way, the situation is even graver for those women because whoever they let's would... Not, hang on, let's not, that go, let's to, not go there. Would, it would Jean, be a Jean, crime. Jean, I'm getting you, on to mitigation yeah, you, you, must get on, you must get on to the it. Government, Jean, the government, the UK Jean, government... Jean, this is, a, this is a democratic forum where there are four people who have equal rights mm. for equal time. So just restrict yourself, okay. you'd be so kind. So, mitigation. If the UK government would care to give us a share of the £12 billion they intend to save through the rape clause and the two-child policy, then we will be very happy to consider how we make lives better for women and children in Scotland. Shadow Minister Adam Tompkins. Um, this is an incredibly uh, sensitive issue. Um, uh, and I think it's important to understand, uh, first, the underlying policy. Uh, the underlying policy is that uh, child tax credits will be available only to the first, child, first two children uh, in a family. And why? Uh, because it is important to restore a sense of balance and proportion in the system between the rights and obligations of taxpayers who fund the benefits that we're talking about and the rights and obligations of claimants who rely on the benefits uh, that we're talking about. And look, this is, a, this is a fine judgment, and different political parties will have different judgments about how to draw the line and where to draw the line in terms of the balance between fairness to the taxpayer and uh, fairness uh, to uh, claimants. Uh, as soon as uh, this policy was first announced, a year and a half ago, um, it was immediately clear 
uh, to us, that, would, that there would have to be a number of exemptions. There is an exemption for multiple births. There's an exemption for uh, children who are, taken, uh, who are adopted uh, out of care. And there is, of course, an exemption for these very rare cases, but in incredibly traumatic, incredibly difficult cases, where a child has been uh, conceived uh, as a result of, um, a, a, of a rape. Um, and it is important in all of those cases that women are still able uh, to claim uh, child tax credits, irrespective of whether we're talking about the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, or but sixth child. But you do have to child, demonstrate, uh, Adam, in, in a family. Adam, no, no, you I'm, have to, hold I'm, on, I, want, hold I'm, on I, want, I know, but you can, and I'm going to put a question in which is pertinent, so just let me put the question no, in sure. as well, and then you can carry on. It, you still have to demonstrate, by one means or another, that you uh, have been raped. What that you, is correct. What, what, what you have to do uh, is you have to fill in a form if you're the mother. Uh, the form itself uh, is four pages long. And the, and, 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 and the part of the form that, you, that the mother has to fill in is only the first page of the form, and the mother has to supply her name, national insurance number, the name of the child, and sign the form. And that's it. This is a form which has been designed with women's support groups uh, al alongside. And, and, and in, in, in comparison with the trauma of a, a rape victim going through a protracted court case, um, in comparison with the you know, really quite significant bureaucracy that is involved in claiming criminal injuries uh, compensation, um, this is uh, a, you know, a very different uh, order of uh, magnitude indeed. But look, I want to come to the point of mitigation, which you let Jean uh, Freeman say something about. You know, the, it, we designed um, welfare devolution in Scotland um, so that not only would there be some streams of social security that the Scottish Government would have complete control over in Scotland, but in addition to that, the Scottish Parliament has the power to top up any aspect of the United Kingdom's social security, no, no. Uh, which continues to be reserved to the Westminster uh, no. Parliament. And to, um, to top up child tax credits would cost in this financial year £20 million. Well, this year in Scotland, this year, the Scottish Government's budget went up by £350 million because of additional public spending in England. Okay, so now the let Scottish me put, Parliament, okay, point, the the Scottish point, Parliament made, has all of the powers made, and all of the resources it needs yeah, you don't, to ensure that this does not me, apply in me, Scotland at all. Forgive me, both of you. You make the point. You don't need to repeat the point for people to understand it. It was totally clear. And let me now ask, because um, you said that's not true, Gene Freeman. Let me put to you, you... you uh, you're saying, no, that's not true. Do you or do you not have the power to top up at the cost of this year of 20 million? We if, do you, if you choose to do it. We do have powers to top up. However, our budget is being cut by 9.2% over went time. Up this year. Our Your budget, budget went will up be by cut half a billion pounds. By 9.2%. And you know, that's Adam, you cannot, you simply cannot, simply deflect all the time and say that the Scottish Government is there to mop up the mess so you don't of want the, the top Tories up at UK. That is not what I said. If you don't want the top-up power, why did the SNP agree to it in the Smith Commission? what I said. But why should we continue to mop up the mess of the Tory government? We already spend power. £400 million. Pounds. We've already spent £400 million pounds mitigating the bedroom tax, helping people because they have to wait six weeks on universal credit delay, helping people through the council tax reduction, all of which are as a consequence of UK Tory government policies. Our job is not there to make your job easier. That's the discussion between the two principal parties engaged in this. Um, slightly looking from outside, Mark Littlewood. There's a very simple solution to this and to other problems in welfare spending. The UK as a whole spends well over £200 billion a year on welfare spending, actually to a pretty remarkable lack of effect. You would have think for that bill we could have solved poverty by now. We don't seem to have done so. But the easy solution to this is not for the SNP and the Conservatives to get into some arguments about top-ups. It's for Scotland and England to have completely separate welfare systems. In my view, the Scottish Parliament should be entirely in control of welfare, even if Scotland remains in the UK. The idea that you have, from on high, delivered from Whitehall, a one-size-fits-all policy, uh, dealing with often contentious and extremely difficult and traumatic issues, is simply wrong. Even if Scotland stays, the Holyrood Parliament should be given the powers to design and pay for Scotland's own totally independent welfare system, and then you wouldn't have to have these spats with Westminster, and then maybe nationalism wouldn't be such a dangerous thing. Yeah. 
Lord Faulkner. The purpose of child tax credits, which were introduced by the Labour government, was to prevent there being poverty among families where the parents were working. I can't see how anybody who believes in that principle thinks it's appropriate to stop alleviating poverty when you've got more than two children, because the people who suffer in relation to that are the children, not the parents. I think the Tories' position is disgusting. <laughs> I find Jean's protestations as to why they won't spend 20 million to bring these children out of poverty utterly hypocritical. Let me go, let me go back. You, you've heard now, perhaps for the first time, very clear answers to the challenge that you posed. What's your own view, Carol Clark? I think uh, the Scottish Government should mitigate the rape clause, and I'm sure they will. And I also think the Tories have been shown up for what they are. Careless, uncaring, when I can't say the rest. <laughs> I, before we go on to our next, I'll remind you once more of the Any Answers number, because this arouses very strong views very clearly, not only in Scotland, but elsewhere as well. Anand, waiting for your call. Our next, please. David Muircroft. Does the Prime Minister's refusal to appear on any live TV debates during the election campaign nullify <coughs> her claim to being a strong leader that the country requires? Adam Tompkins. No, um, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 the que but the questioner is absolutely right that this election is all about strong leadership. This, this, that, that's what You're this not is going, going to, to give a, a strong and stable government, are you? But, but, this, well, Adam, well, we, I we, thought well, Jonathan, we are. That's exactly what we're going to do. We are going to deliver a strong and stable government. Mm. Strong and stable for Scotland and strong and stable for the whole of the United Kingdom. Um, th this, this election is all about leadership. It's about uh, the strong and stable leadership that Theresa May uh, will offer versus the weak and floundering leadership, if you can call it that, uh, of Jeremy Corbyn, a man that Charlie Faulkner and many others don't even think is fit to be leader of the Labour Party, never mind uh, Prime Minister of this United uh, Kingdom. But look, um, there will be leadership debates uh, in Scotland because leadership debates are a long-standing as uh, aspect of the tradition of uh, Scottish elections, non-divisive um, Scottish elections. Even before the days of uh, devolution, there were uh, leadership debates between Secretaries of State for Scotland and SNP leaders uh, and all of the And here of they're it. judged to but be of, of important democratic in Scotland, a major contribution think, to the democratic I don't debate. Think is. Is, I don't think there is any reliable evidence anywhere that they make any difference to election no, no, uh, that's election. Not Quite, that's, uh, not quite out, the, that's, not quite, that's not quite the same point as you as a uh, professor of law will understand. I'm saying well, that they make an important contribution to democratic debate. Whether or not they have an impact on the election is quite another matter. They're, they're stories that last in the, in the papers for maybe as much as 24 hours. That's, if that's an important contribution to debate, then uh, that, that, that's really all they are. So they're a waste they're, of time in Scotland as well, they're, in, they're an innovation uh, in the uh, United Kingdom elections. And are, through, are they a waste of time and, in Scotland? And, and, and I think they make very little difference to outcomes. And I think what elections really are all about are, are, are outcomes. Outcomes. And the outcome of this election will be determined on the basis of what people across the United Kingdom think about the strong leadership that Theresa May will offer versus the weak and chaotic leadership, if you can call it that, that Jeremy Corbyn would offer. Charlie Faulkner. Could I, could I try and get away from the sort of robotic cliché that Adam has been provided with by Conservatives? Interesting, interesting that Labour don't want to talk about leadership. No, I, I do want to talk about leadership, and I do think that the question is a really important one. Mrs May is saying to the United Kingdom, I am going to the country in order to make Britain stronger in its negotiations with the European Union. That is obvious rubbish. The European Union, the European Union have made it absolutely clear that makes no difference. Why then is Mrs May going to the country? She is going to the country because she has been reading the opinion polls and she thinks this is a big opportunity for her to get a big majority. But Charlie, the Labour Party wait just a minute, voted wait a minute, for this election in the House of Wait Commons. a minute. She, 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 she has read the opinion polls and she hopes that she's going to get a big majority. Why? So that she can move the country right-wingwards yes. and do what the Tories want, like their child 
credit policy that we've just heard all about from Adam. The reason why, and a debate would be important, was so that that could be revealed to the country. But no, she won't do it. I would imagine she won't do it because she reads the opinion polls and thinks she's far better off staying off the telly in relation to it. So, in answer to your question, does it show strong leadership or weak leadership? It shows, in my opinion, very cowardly leadership. Charlie Faulkner, might it be thought that given his standing in the country, according to every single poll and to many of your colleagues in the House of Commons and in the House of Lords, that actually, as a result, Jeremy Corbyn has been spared a drubbing. Jeremy Corbyn has made it absolutely clear he wants the debate. Uh -huh. but, but he's also said that he won't do it unless she does. So he's not well, prepared to debate well, anyone else. If, is, if, is that just self-importance? If, if, if you're right, Jeremy, that Jeremy has been spared... Sorry, did I call you Jeremy? I meant Jonathan. <laughs> uh, <laughs> If, if you're Don't right worry. and Jonathan Corbyn has been spared uh, <laughs> a, a, a drubbing, why on earth did Mrs May not want the debate? I can't, t I can't explain that. It's very simple. Um, uh, look, to coin a phrase, I think it's usually a good idea to have strong and stable television debates in the national interest. Um, but the, <laughs> it's pretty obvious why Theresa May isn't doing them, and they are for the same reasons that Charlie's good friend Tony Blair didn't do them. If you are 15 or 20 per cent ahead in the opinion polls, why risk it? That's why she is not doing them. Uh, it is a tactical judgment. No more and no less. That's what it is. I would say this, however. I don't think that we as the electorate should get too hung up about the TV debates themselves. Obviously, the broadcasters love them and, uh, and uh, the media love them, and it's a great way of covering what otherwise so far has been an unbelievably and, dull and, and, general and, election. And, and it should be said, millions of people do watch them. Sure, but millions of people... Many millions. But millions of people will, will watch the news and read newspapers. What I think is most important in this election is not whether or not we have some slightly contrived sort of stand-up fight between Corbyn and May and various others. It's that there is the proper cross-examination of the platforms and the politicians from each and every party. And if I see Theresa May in another factory spitting sound bites, <laughs> or Jeremy Corbyn in another school spitting sound bites, I will switch my television off. They do need to make themselves um, open to the cross-examination, not just from journalists, but from the people. That doesn't require a TV debate, but it does require, I think, the leaders of all political parties to show a little bit more courage and a little bit more honesty and openness than they have done so far in this rather disappointing election campaign. Jean Freeman. Well, I, I do agree with Charlie in saying, and in fact Mark, about why uh, Theresa May is refusing to do this in that she has looked at the opinion polls. But I also think there is another reason. I don't think Theresa May likes being disagreed with. And when she called the general election, she said, the country is united, but Westminster is divided. I'm sorry, Westminster is supposed to be, as our UK Parliament, a place of argument and debate. So if you don't like opposition, you're in the wrong job as a politician. So I genuinely think she has made a cold calculation. She doesn't like disagreement. She's not going to do the TV debates because she does not want scrutiny. And in the same way as the child tax policy and the rape clause is exposing the Tories in Scotland for what they really are, Theresa May does not want that level of scrutiny and exposure to all her other policies. That's why it's all about strong and stable leadership. No, it's not. It's about no opposition. That's why it's about our position in negotiating with Europe. Frankly, it's not going to make a blind bit of difference to those 27 other countries and how they negotiate with her, whatever size her majority is. So it is actually not strong leadership. It's cold, it's calculated, and it is designed to be really quite elitist because the rest of us are only supposed to get to see what she's really like and what she really stands for. It, 
If Theresa May would like to explain for herself <laughs> why she's not participating in any debate, uh, she could bring any answers. Uh, <laughs> 03 700 100 444. Um, we go to our next, please. Sheila, Sheila Halpin, why is it okay to question a Christian about his faith, but not followers of other faiths? Tim Farron, you're thinking of, I imagine, who's been uh, sed sedulously questioned about his attitude towards gay sex. Um, is it in your mind that, that the same things are not put to Jews, to Muslims? Yes. yes. Mark Littlewood. I think it was ridiculous, the cross-examination of Tim Farron. I don't really care what politicians uh, think may or may not be a sin. That's a private matter for them. I care about what they're going to tax, regulate and ban. And uh, whether people have a private faith in anything whatsoever, whether it be Christian, Muslim, Jewish, uh, whether, like me, you define yourself as a lapsed atheist, uh, 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 I, I don't now, think Mark? that any of these are matters for serious policy and political debate. And we have to get back, I think, in British politics to actually understanding there is a division between people's private theological beliefs and what they do in the public arena. And I think the way that Tim Farron was pressed and pressed again on his theological beliefs was inappropriate. I think it was a witch hunt. And I think that his private faith should remain private and is not pertinent to his public political um, uh, claims, suggestions, or anything else. So let's allow people to believe what they want about God, whichever God they care to believe in, and let's actually just listen to what their policies are and cross-examine them on those grounds and those grounds alone. Jean Freeman. I think that the spiritual and theological beliefs that people have are an important part of who we are and of our society and of our country. And that stretches back over many, many decades. But I don't think that it is right to uh, cross-examine or pillory anyone about those beliefs. What I think is right is for all of us to make an effort to understand different theological beliefs and have discussions and uh, under increased understanding about those. But like Mark, what matters about a politician is what they're going to do and the value base on which they, from which they operate. So I think it's perfectly fair to, to want to know what a politician's values are, any politician, and to see how well what they then do or say or uh, the decisions they make square up against their professed values. Is it part, of your, is it part, of, is it part of your values? And if you, if you believe that gay, we've, we saw a, a, an MP has resigned for what he said about uh, 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 homosexuality, is it part of your value that you do or don't believe that uh, s sex between consenting men or women, gay sex, is right or wrong? I think you're suggesting it is perfectly part of your values and that we should know that? Well, I think, I think you're... I mean, f yes, I do. I think that your values are around things like whether you know or not you believe people are, uh, can have different views, different sexuality, and still uh, have the right to equality of treatment. I think that is yeah. entirely... A value is one I happen to hold. I think it is reasonable if you want people to support you as a politician to make decisions about a whole range of things. It's not all tax in the economy and Brexit and independence. It's also social policy and a range of other matters. And I think it's fair for people who have a vote, which they will then lend to us as politicians if they vote for us, they lend us their power, to want to know what our values are. Thank you. But that's different from pillaring people because they hold certain values. Thank the you. point is Thank to you. understand them. <laughs> Professor Tompkins. Uh, I agree with, um, I think, everything that Jean just said and almost everything that, 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 that Mark said. I mean, I think that the value that Jean is talking about there is the value of toleration. And I think um, toleration uh, is a value in, in public life um, uh, that a, a lot of our policies uh, would be uh, based on in all 
uh, political parties, uh, and that we should be uh, quizzed about and, uh, and interrogated on. But there is a difference between the public value of toleration and privately believing what is or is not um, a sin in a particular um, Christian creed or other um, uh, spiritual uh, credo of, of some sort of description. Look, we are, you know, we're all in, in public life, but at the same time, uh, and we all recognize um, uh, that in, you know, in being in public life, we make certain sacrifices in terms of things that for other people who aren't in public life would remain entirely, enti entirely private and unknown. For but we're still, entitled, those, those... We're, we're, we're still entitled to a private life and a very, very, very important part of private life is religious uh, belief, and I, I, I would like to see. I wouldn't like to see our politics being entirely secular, because I think that religious belief is an important part but, but of, there, of who we are. Is there but a slightly the same... different point here? If you are aspiring for power, and if you believe that, for instance, gay sex is wrong in the past, it used to be a crime. If you believe it is wrong, then is it important that we should know whether you do or don't believe that? Um, yeah, yeah, I think it is. I mean, look, I mean, because th so that, that's what he was being pressed on. Um, I think he was being pressed on a lot more than that. We're talking about Tim Farron. I think Tim Farron was being pressed on a lot more than that. I think he was talking not only about what he thought the scope of the criminal law statute book should be, but also, you know, what he personally believed in terms, of, in terms of what is, is and is not a sin. OK, thank you. And I'm um, sorry, not very long. Charlie Faulkner. I disagree strongly with what Mark said. Of course we should not discriminate against people for their religious beliefs. But... Politicians believe things. If a politician believes, for whatever reason, gay sex is wrong, then he's discriminating against gays. I don't criticise Tim Farron for believing that for religious reasons, but I would criticise him if that was his position. And I'm afraid it is entirely legitimate to ask people, for example, what their attitude to people being gay or gay sex is. And I don't think one can then excuse them because it's a religious belief. You can form a view about whether you want to support him for that reason. You can understand he does it for religious reasons. But he's a politician. He's saying he believes things. So let's hear what he believes in. And if he believes that gay sex is wrong, that is a very important element, it seems to me, in making a judgment about and it. And he said, in fact, when, when pressed, that he did not think it was wrong. Well, so I he think ended he, up saying, he wasn't I sure whether there. it was a sin to start with, and after two or three days he decided it wasn't a sin, no doubt, after consulting with a number of theologians. We've, we've got to leave it there. Next week we're going to be in West Sussex. From here in Blantyre, Old Parish Church, thank you to our panel, thank you to our audience, thank you for the questions, and goodbye. <laughs>